yesterday I was I was trying to remember what uh, brought Karen and I to to the decision to do this, and I can't really recall exactly what it was, but I think it was that uh, you know that that we want more information. You know, that we're really looking for more information. I think everyone is. Um, so right at the very beginning, I want to define what we're talking about. Um, so we're going to call it cell-based meat, okay? That's what we have as a panel determined that we all can agree on to call it at this point. It's, yes, it is the title. Um, and, you know, it has a lot of other names. Uh, there's cultured meat, clean meat, in vitro meat, uh, slaughter-free meat, lab-grown meat, alt meat, I heard recently. That was an interesting one. Um, so, uh, so, you know, and what we're talking about, we're not talking about products that are out now like Beyond Burger and Impossible Meat where um, it's a plant-based product that mimics meat. Okay, that's not what we're talking about at all. Those are products on the market now, and they uh, uh, are made by from plants and mimic meat, you know, in in ways that the texture and everything is very similar. What we're talking about is a product that's not on the market yet, doesn't exist yet, uh, and it's taking cells from living animals. Okay. And uh, growing those cells in a media, a, a, a nutrient, um, uh, uh, a nutrient-rich liquid-type thing that, and I'm sure they'll they'll be able to d to d <laughs> describe it a lot better than me. Um, you know that, but this this cultured medium it, it provides nutrients. There's like salt, sugar, amino acids, those kinds of things. Um, some, I think they use a, a scaffolding that periodically moves, so it mimics muscle movement to develop, uh, and it can develop into different types of m muscle cells, fat cells, tissue, to create meat-like products, different cuts of meat, if you will. Um, so, uh, so that's what we're talking about, okay? Just so we're very clear, uh, and, we'll, and we'll get even more information about that. And another thing that I want to just touch on, and, and I think it, it's really a cool thing about this, is that everyone here up on this panel, um, I think, can agree on the big picture of we all want to see a world where no animal suffers at human hands. Can we all agree on that? Yes. We all agree on that. And that's great. That's awesome. That is a beautiful thing. So, um, so, so, so what we're debating is ideas, strategies, tactics, these kinds of things. So it's not, we're not debating, you know, that we want a vegan world. <laughs> um, we all want that. So, uh, so just to keep that in mind as we go forward, you know, that this is really um, a, 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 a a, a, a playing of ideas, a debating of, um, uh, of, of uh, strategy and tactic and not like attack on character or, or individuals or organizations. It's, you know, um, it, it's, uh, it's really about um, the tactics. So just, just a thought on that. And, you know, I'm personally in the perfect place here, being right in the middle, um, because I am right in the middle on this issue. Uh, when I first heard about it, I think that uh, I reacted like I would say probably most uh, vegan animal rights activists react. My reaction was, ew, I'd never eat it, but great if it's going to save animals, right? You know, generally that's my reaction and I think most people's initial reaction. And so I was for it. I was fine with it. Uh, but something, I don't know, just was not sitting right with me every time I thought about it a little deeper. Um, it just, there were some, there were questions that were coming up in my mind, and then suddenly I was seeing that other activists and vegans were having these same kind of concerns and questions. And I was like, ah, okay, so I'm not alone. Um, that's interesting. Uh, and so I think that's, that's why we're here today, is to explore this. Um, you know, I haven't made any kind of decision. I feel like I need way more information, and that's why I'm very excited that we're doing this. Um, so, you know, just a little background. I'm sure we'll get more. There's numerous cell-based meat companies that 
are in pro not necessarily in production now, but in the research and development phase, uh, trying to get this product uh, happening. Um, we have in the U.S. Uh, Memphis Meats, Mosa Meats. Uh, was Hampton Creek is now just you know just egg, just mayo is is they create they create uh, plant based foods, but they're also um, looking into cell based meats. Uh, finless Foods, I love the name, is a, a seafood uh, a plant or cell based meat company that's also uh, you know uh, planning to produce uh, seafood cell based seafood. And, uh, and across the world, uh, we're seeing it as well. Um, in Israel, we've got uh, super meat, uh, future meat technologies, meet the future. It's another good name. Uh, <laughs> so, um, you know, so it's, it's really interesting. It's, it's very much um, uh, uh, incredibly prevalent. And even Big Ag is getting in the game. They are uh, seeing a potential here. We've got Tyson, Cargill, I'm sure others are looking into it, are investing in it. Um, so it's fascinating. And there's also, we're, are, we're already starting to see legislation around it, around the labeling, what's, what's it going to be called. Um, the meat industry is getting a little concerned about this. There's a, 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 um, a piece of legislation going around Washington State right now that would actually make it a crime to sell cell-based meat. It's, it's fascinating, um, you know, and it's, it's basically, uh, you know, the, of course, their, their line is that uh, we, don't, we don't know if it's safe, it's also new, all of that kind of thing, but of course, it's, you know, it's the meat industry getting scared. So it's fascinating, fascinating. Um, so we're going to get into it all today. Um, I am going to introduce all the speakers, um, I think, right now, and then we're, we're going to, how it's going to work is that each speaker is going to have a 12-minute 12 12 minute introduction. Uh, some are going to use PowerPoint. 12-minute introduction, just to kind of get us all on the same page, really understanding the arguments. Uh, and then I'm going to start asking some questions, and we're going to kind of just open it up and go back and forth. OK? Uh, so I'm going to introduce everyone first. Um, over here, this is, the, this is the pro side, the four side over here and the against, so, so you know what's going on and who's who. Uh, Bruce Friedrich has been a, a, a longtime activist. Um, he is uh, the executive director of the Good Food Institute. Uh, that's a 51c3 nonprofit that promotes innovative alternatives to industrially produced animal foods. Um, Bruce has penned opinion pieces for USA Today, The Wall Street Journal, Los Angeles Times, many other publications. Uh, he's a popular speaker um, at college campuses. He's presented at, um, at top universities, Harvard, Yale, Princeton, Stanford, MIT. He's co-authored co two books, contributed chapters to six books, authored seven law review articles, um, and graduated from Georgetown Law uh, and um, also graduated uh, Pi Beta Kappa from Grinnell College. Um, and he also holds degrees at John Hopkins University and the uh, London School of Economics, so quite, quite a background. Um, and I just saw him recently, actually, on CBS This Morning. I was watching my little, you know, on the, on the elliptical, <laughs> my little morning, uh, morning CBS this morning um, clips, and uh, he was there giving an interview about um, uh, vegan seafood. So Bruce is everywhere. <laughs> That's awesome. Um, thank you for being here. Thank you for having us. Yeah. Okay, and then also on the pro side, we have um, Leah Garces. Am I saying it good? Yay! <laughs> um, she is the new first female president of Mercy for Animals. Uh, yay! <laughs> she was the founder of uh, Compassion in World Farming USA, and she's the author of a forthcoming book called Grilled, Turning Adversaries into Allies in the Fight to Change the Chicken Industry. She is an animal advocate who has partnered with some of the largest food companies in the world with a mission to end the exploitation of animals for food. Her work has been featured in many national and international media outlets, including the New York Times, Washington Post, BuzzFeed, Vice, uh, Chicago Tribune, on and on. Um, she is the contributing author to Huffington Post and Food Safety News. Uh, Leah uh, serves on the advisory board of Encompass and Seattle Food Tech, 
and she's the mom of three incredible kids. <laughs> All right. Only two? Okay. Well, he knows. He's met him. Okay. <laughs> so, all right. And on the, op on the opposing side, we have, uh, this is uh, Vasile Stanisku. He has received his PhD in the modern thought, modern thought and literature at Stanford University. So he was here with us at Stanford, but now he's in Atlanta, Georgia. He is currently assistant professor of communication at Mercer. Uh, university. His current research interests include locavorism, humane meat, invasive species, the linkage between food and col colonialism, and the intersection between environmentalism and animal studies. Uh, Vasily is the co-senior editor uh, of Critical Animal Studies uh, book series and the former co-editor of the Journal of Critical Animal Studies. He's the author of over 20 peer-reviewed publications on critical animal studies, and his research has been recognized by the Woods Institute for the Environment, Minding Animals International, the Andrew Mellon Foundation, the Culture and Animals Foundation, and the list goes on. So thank you for being here. All right, and then finally over here, in his wonderful Renaissance man coat. I love this coat. <laughs> Fabulous. Um, the postmodern prince. Yes. <laughs> um, so, John Sanbanmatsu, uh, PhD, is the associate professor of philosophy at Worcester. Uh, um, I can never say it. Worcester. I always want to say Worcester. It's not. <laughs> Uh, Polytech Institute in Massachusetts. Uh, John's work is critical in critical animal studies probes the nature of speciesism uh, as a mode of production, particularly as it inter intersects with capitalism. His articles and essays have appeared in Huffington Post, Christian Science Monitor, and other venues. In addition, he's the editor of the book Critical Theory and Animal Liberation and the author of The Postmodern Prince. Uh, at present, he is at work on a new book, which I'm very excited about and can't wait to read. It's called The Omnivore's Deception. Uh, yes. <laughs> Great name, right? Great title. Uh, about the ecological crisis, the myth of humane meat, and the troubling nature of our relationship with other animals. Okay, what a fantastic panel we have. Let's give them all a hand. So we are going to have the pro side go first. Who's going to go first? Bruce. Bruce is up. Um, all right. So um, thank you very much, Hope, for the introduction. You did give a lot of my talk, just for the record. <laughs> um, and thank you, uh, Voss and John, for agreeing to do this. And uh, Karen. No. Thank you, Leah, for agreeing to do this. Uh, and there's Karen. Thank you for having us. Thank you for uh, working with Hope to organize the conference. It is a uh, delight and an honor to be here with all of you chatting about uh, why Leah and I believe. So I was uh, thanking everybody on behalf of both of us, Leah. Uh, why Leah and I believe that, uh, what's the title of the resolution? Resolved, cell-based meat is good for animals. So I want to start by just uh, talking about a couple of things that I think most of you, uh, most of us know uh, but that I think are useful as sort of background for the conversation that we're about to have. Um, I think folks here probably know that animal agriculture causes more climate change than all forms of transportation combined. So then all of the trains and the planes and the cars and the trucks, animal agriculture is responsible for about 14.5% of climate change. Um, at GFI, we're talking more and more. There we go. Uh, about antibiotic resistance bacteria. According to a report from the UK government a couple of years ago, antibiotic resistant bacteria is going to kill more people than cancer by 2050. It'll be killing 10 million people a year by 2050. We'll be costing the global economy $10 trillion. And then uh, I'm guessing if you didn't see this, that you'll be surprised to hear that all of you who oppose slaughterhouses, it's actually about 47% of Americans also oppose slaughterhouses. Now, the meat industry read about this, and they were absolutely flabbergasted, and they realized it was a group called the Sentience Institute uh, that had released the report, and that's an animal rights uh, think tank, the Sentience, Sentience Institute. So they picked a researcher at Oklahoma State University, a hand-picked ag researcher at Oklahoma State Re University, and said, you know, prove these vegans wrong. And uh, he ran the numbers, and he came up with the exact same number, 47% of Americans 
want to ban slaughterhouses. And yet, when surveys are actually done, what we find is that 98% of Americans continue to eat meat. So we see numbers like 5% vegetarian, 7% vegetarian, 2% vegan, or whatever. Um, once Faunalytics actually asked people, in the last month, what products have you not eaten? Uh, what they determined was that two out of three vegetarians had eaten fish or chicken in the last month. So not vegetarian. And this is what meat consumption looks like in the United States. And those of you who are attentive to the small, bird, the small animals as opposed to the large animals will also realize that uh, this graph for the United States is similar to the graph globally. So although uh, it looks like meat consumption is skyrocketing on the previous slide, and it looks like meat consumption is fairly stagnant since 1970 on this slide, uh, because chicken consumption has skyrocketed, even as beef consumption has somewhat fallen, the actual number of animals slaughtered has gone up from somewhere on the order of 5 billion animals per year uh, to almost 10 billion animals per year. And in the United States alone, we eat about 100 million pigs, about 40 million cows, and 9 billion chickens. It's literally 250 chickens for every cow, 100 chickens for every pig. Um, 2018, according to the USDA, was the highest per capita meat consumption in U.S. history. USDA says that in 2019, per capita meat consumption is going to be even higher. All that despite the revolution almost 50 years ago. This is the book that turned me vegan in 1987, so I'm going on 32 years of veganism. So the book that started... Thank you. So the book that started a revolution in the way that Americans eat. Uh, since that revolution started almost 50 years ago, uh, we are now eating annually about 5 billion additional animals. I wish the revolution had been more successful. Uh, 20 years ago this year, I put this video together, Meet Your Meat. It's now been seen by literally millions of people. Uh, 10 years ago, 10 years ago um, I put together the Glass Walls video, which was narrated by Paul McCartney. And I just want to underline again, this is what's happening with meat consumption. Uh, number of animals since 1996, it's about 2 billion additional animals every single year. And globally, we're expected to need 70% more meat by the year 2050. So um, hopefully people listened to Karen's presentation a moment, a moment ago. Nobody paints a picture of what animal suffering looks like better than Karen Davis paints a picture of what animal suffering looks like. But uh, chickens on these farms, as, uh, as Karen illustrated, every single moment of their lives is categorized by abject misery. Poultry scientists at the University of Arkansas said that if a human baby grew as quickly as a modern broiler chicken, she would weigh more than 600 pounds by the time she was one year old. 600 pounds. Every moment of these animals' lives is categorized by unmitigated misery. So we need to be very laser-focused on asking the question, if I were a hen in one of these battery cages, if I were a chicken in one of these broiler sheds, what would I want my advocates to be doing and supporting? So Chatham House, the Royal Institute of International Affairs, is the foremost think tank in, the, in uh, Europe. Uh, about three years ago, they were looking at the climate issue. And they said, it is a scientific impossibility that the governments of the world meet their obligations under the Paris Climate Agreement to keep climate change under 2 degrees Celsius by 2050, a scientific impossibility unless animal product consumption goes down. The Chinese government rose to the... Yeah, it's good, right? The Chinese government rose to the challenge. In 2015, they said, we are going to cut our, our meat consumption in half by 2030. What do you think's happened to Chinese meat consumption since, 2013, since 2015? Yeah, it's skyrocketing. It's absolutely skyrocketing. It seems to me that what we have been doing for 50 years or 20 years or 10 years or whatever, um, it's important. We need to change the zeitgeist. We need to educate people. We need to be a voice for animals. Um, and I'm not advocating that anybody change what it is that they're focusing on or what it is that they're working on. Uh, but it certainly seems to me that we should be looking at, we should be using all the tools in our toolkit. So at GFI, we think this is the tool of choice. <laughs> ben and Jerry's vegan ice cream. 
who here likes Ben and Jerry's? All right, a couple of people are, you know, don't, probably don't like them because Unilever bought them, but almost everybody raised their hand. Um, and the reason you raised your hand is that Ben and Jerry's tastes amazing, right? Everybody, nobody thought, eh, it's not healthy, you know? Everybody <laughs> thought it tastes amazing, it's reasonably priced, that's what you were focused on. And in fact, 100% of the world thinks about taste and price when they're thinking about when they're making their dietary choices, even at Whole Foods, even at the co-op, you look at what people are buying. Like it, these are the two dichotomous factors of food choice. If it doesn't taste at least acceptable, nobody's going to eat it. If you can't afford it, you're not going to eat it. Um, and then convenience is also important. If you can't find it, you're not going to eat it. I actually used this slide in Mexico, and everybody just sort of looked at me like, we don't know what this Ben and Jerry's thing is. Uh, so the slide didn't go over well, which uh, sort of underlines the idea that no matter how awesome a food is, if you can't find it, uh, you're not going to eat it. So... But how do we apply the Ben and Jerry's trifecta to food? Uh, one way we do it is we grow meat directly from cells. Because for the vast majority of people, they think meat tastes great. They're not eating it because they want to see animals slaughtered. 47% of them, all of whom know slaughterhouses are essential to meat, still think slaughterhouses should be banned, remarkably. Um, nobody is a fan of causing more climate change. Nobody is a fan of factory farms. Nobody is a fan of slaughterhouses. You know, we all have loved ones who continue to eat meat, and they say things like, I don't want to know. You know, where else in your life do you want, not want to know, right? Where else is there this cognitive dissonance? There's something in human beings. I don't know if it's psychology or physiology or emotion or what, but there's something that causes a lot of people to want to continue to eat meat. And we can grow meat directly from cells. Take a biopsy the size of a sesame seed from a live, living turkey and grow turkey meat in perpetuity for everybody. Seems to me if I'm a turkey on a factory farm, that's something I'm pretty excited about. So this is Memphis Meats, uh, cell-based, clean. Uh, we call it clean meat oftentimes as a nod to clean energy. Clean energy is energy that's better for the environment. Clean meat is meat that's better for the environment. It's also just literally a cleaner product. That's a meatball. That's uh, clean meat duck. And that's what clean meat will look like at scale. Your friendly neighborhood meat brewery, essentially. <laughs> I'm going to spare you. Everybody in here knows what a factory farm and a slaughterhouse looks like. Not this pretty. You know, Memphis Meats is planning on streaming their production um, on the internet. You get boring after about 10 seconds, but it, it makes, I think, a critical point. Um, so who's excited about clean meat? Ingrid Newkirk is excited about clean meat, the president of PETA. Uh, her deepness, Sylvia Earle, the foremost living marine biologist, is excited about clean meat for its capacity to save our seas. Um, GFI had a conference, and we had, at our conference, we had USDA, ADM, Tyson Ventures, DFJ, Kraft Heinz. We had moderators from the Wall Street Journal, the New York Times, Inc. Magazine, Good Morning America. This is something that, uh, you know, an animal rights conference is not going to bring these sorts of thinkers together. I love this quote from Tyson Ventures talking about how awesome he thought our conference was, how excited he was about it. Um, as Hope mentioned, um, I know that, uh, that John and Voss are planning to use this against us, but uh, we, can have that, we can have that discussion in the, uh, we can have that at the, do that at the discussion. Uh, former CEO of Tyson Foods, the last, the last sentence of the cover story about this guy, if we can make meat without the animal, why wouldn't we? Former CEO of Google, Eric Schmidt, very excited about plant-based meat and clean meat, not, just not because he cares about animals, but because he wants to feed the world high-quality protein without the climate impact. Uh, Bill Gates, very excited about the capacity to feed hundreds of millions of people in the developing world using clean meat. This is a slide that shows uh, the clean meat investment landscape. Uh, so the first clean meat company was, was uh, incorporated in 2016. Clean meat companies, there are now more than a dozen of them that have raised a million dollars or more. Uh, and then I'm going to just say a couple of words about what the Good Food Institute does. And wow, 12 minutes goes fast. All right, so at the Good Food Institute, we have four programmatic departments, science and technology, innovation, corporate engagement, policy, and international engagement. International engagement is a multiplier. So science and technology, we're laying the groundwork for both plant-based meat and cell-based meat. Innovation department is starting companies, among other things. Corporate engagement, we are actually meeting with Tyson and Smithfield and Purdue and other companies. And policy, we are inspiring governments, including the US government, to put money into this space. 
Animal Charity Evaluators has done an evaluation and ranked us a top charity three years in a row. Uh, the last thing I want to say is this is not for you. We don't care if you eat it. You're a vegan. You're on our side already. Um, it will save massive numbers of animals, or at least has a very good prospect to do so. The bar for the opposition is insanely high. Think about the hens in the cages. And in 100 years, all meat is not even going to be th thought of as an animal product any more than insulin is today. 1951, 10,000 pounds of pig pancreas to make a pound of insulin. We would be having this, we'd be having this debate and somebody would be saying, insulin is an animal product. We absolutely can't go to synthetic insulin. If you want to learn more about GFI, you can find our annual report at gfi.org up slash 2018. You can go to gfi.org to get our bi-weekly newsletter. You can email me if you want our monthly highlights. Thank you. <laughs> I came here today to bring you three simple truths about in vitro meat. Simple truth number one, in vitro meat harms the planet. Proponents of in vitro meat like to claim that it will help the planet. However, what they fail to mention is that the only peer-reviewed study, positive peer-reviewed study, was both commissioned and funded exclusively by the in vitro meat industry, was published by a graduate student, and was based solely on a series of possible future thought experiments, assumptions which are premised on a series of technologies which currently do not exist and are unlikely to exist in the future. To provide one example among many, the study assumed that all in vitro meat would be grown exclusively in cyanobacteria hydrostate, a type of algae, even though no in vitro meat is currently cultured in this process, and there is no current research proving that it would be possible to do so in the future. Unsurprisingly, I have not been able to locate a single other peer-reviewed study that has duplicated these findings. In fact, later research has found that in vitro meat may be more harmful in terms of climate change than even traditional animal agriculture. As one recent study concluded, cultivation of in vitro meat requires more industrial energy, often produced by burning fossil fuels, than pork, poultry, and maybe even beef. The reason for these counterintuitive results is that while cultured meat uses less land, it requires more energy inputs i.e. fossil fuels, than even factory farms. As a thoughtful article in The Atlantic explained, cell culture is the most expensive and most resource-intensive technique in modern biology. Keeping the cells warm, healthy, well-fed, and free of contamination takes incredible labor and energy, even when scaled, to the 10,000-liter vats the biotech companies use. And on top of that, the fact that these three-dimensional wads of meat would have to be exercised regularly with stretching machinery, essentially elaborate meat gyms, and you begin to understand the incredible challenges of scaling in vitro meat. As Marco Springman, a postgraduate researcher at Oxford University, phrased the same critique, although the technologies are evolving, there is no indication that lab-grown meat is significantly better for the environment and health than existing alternatives to beef. The latest reviews have put the emissions of lab-grown meat at several times that of chicken and far beyond any plant-based alternative. Simple truth number two, in vitro meat hurts animals, lots of animals. The proponents of in vitro meat like to focus on how the meat is grown from a cell of animals without any animals having to be killed to produce these cells, which is true. What, however, they fail to point out is that these cells can currently only be grown in fetal bovine serum, i.e. the blood of unborn cows. Therefore, it is hard to argue that such a practice should be considered either vegan or cruelty-free. 
And just to be clear, such extraction causes massive suffering, as both the mother is killed in order to have her fetus extracted, and the fetus is kept alive outside of the womb for the entirety of the extraction, without any form of anesthesia ever being applied, despite the scientific reality that they show normal brain activity and pain responses for the entirety of the procedure. As a peer-reviewed study specifically on the topic of fetal bovine serum concluded, quote, fetal bovine serum, FBS, is the common component of annual cell culture medium. It is harvested from bovine fetuses taken from pregnant cows during slaughter. FBS is commonly harvested by means of cardiac puncture without any form of anesthesia. Fetuses are exposed to pain and discomfort, so the current practice of fetal bovine serum harvesting is inhumane. Nor are these amounts of bovine fetal harvest small, since each bovine fetus produces relatively little FBS, and since a large amount is necessary to culture these cells, a large number of bovine fetuses are required to produce in vitro meat. Current estimates place the total at over 2 million bovine fetuses and their mothers annually. And this number is growing. And the financial benefit to the factory farms is massive. Since research on in vitro meat has begun, the price that CAFOs can charge for FBS has increased by over 300%. It is currently the single most profitable item that a factory farm sells. Even if other countries do develop new technologies, and some are, in vitro meat represents animal experimentation on a mass scale. And pretending it doesn't because the suffering happens on the farm and not technically in the lab is a distinction without a moral difference. Simple truth number three, in vitro meat helps factory farms. It does it in three ways. One, It keeps people eating meat. Driven by increasing population, increasing obesity rates, and in particular, increasing rates in meat consumption in countries such as China, India, and Brazil, global meat demand is increasing. However, because of hard limits, they're running out of room, space, and the environment. Factory farms cannot meet this demand. In vitro meat is being developed to supply this new demand that Bruce talked about, to keep people eating meat, not to trade off with factory farms. Two, to act as a new filler. Tyson's own internal studies show that people no longer want their meat to look like animals. Think boneless chicken nuggets, which creates the opportunity to create, in their words, a blended product. However, as controversy over Taco Bell blending in soy with its beef or the controversy over so-called pink slime highlights, Consumers often resist this blending process. Factory farms are funding in vitro meat, not to trade off with factory farms, but to be able to use it as a new filler so they can label their product 100% beef. Perhaps they will even market it as an eco-burger. Assuming a 50-50 blend, in vitro meat won't trade off with the number of people who are eating factory farm meat. It will effectively double it. Three, to help with public relations. As you can imagine, Tyson and factory farms do not currently poll well with consumers. Funding clean meat and their small amount of funding for plant-based protein is designed to improve their image and public relations. While the first two are still purely theoretical, this last goal is already working. In January of this year, in part because of their funding of in vitro meat and plant-based protein, Even Bruce claimed in a published interview, quote, for the Good Food Institute in particular, we have really good relationships with Tyson Foods, with Smithfield Foods, with Purdue, with huge chicken conglomerates and meat companies. It's helpful to recognize that the people who run these companies want to do something noble. I don't believe they do. Because the most basic problem of in vitro meat is that it represents a solution without a problem. The idea that the reason that people are refusing to give up meat is because of a lack of adequate meat substitutes is simply untrue. 
from taste to texture to nutritional quality, a cornucopia of options, both natural and artificial, already exist, are widely available and reasonably affordable. Just to highlight the absurd degree to which meat has already been successfully imitated, Impossible Foods even produced a completely vegan hamburger that bleeds. In fact, under taste tests, many non-vegans cannot tell the difference between the real and some of the new imitation products unless they are told. Even Michael Pollan, one of the most famous proponents of humane meat and one of the most ardent critics of so-called mock meat, had to admit in a blind taste test aired on PBS that he could not tell the difference with a sub of actual CAFO meat and a sub made from the new types of mock meat. In, in conclusion, in response to rising concerns about its effect on climate change, coal companies hire consultants to come up with new marketing campaigns to decrease protest, ward off government oversight, confuse consumers and activists, and most importantly, to ward off the growth of actual valid alternatives such as solar and wind. Their terminology was clean coal. Likewise, responding to similar criticism from environmentalists, animal rights organizations, and growing fears of governmental oversight and shifts to actually valid options of identically tasting plant-based options, the meat industry has started to fund a new technology it calls clean meat. However, what we need, what I believe in, the simple and obvious truth is that what we should be fighting for is not for clean meat, but for no meat at all. Thank you. Hi, everyone. How are you doing? Good, good. Thank you for that lively um, discussion. Some facts we will dispute in the coming session. And if I have a couple minutes, I might hand it over to Bruce for at least one uh, fact we would dispute. However, um, I want to talk a little bit about myself, why I'm here. I am Leah Garces. I am the president of Mercy for Animals. Yay! <laughs> Um, and this is our mission, and our mission is to construct, an important word, a compassionate food system by reducing suffering and ending the exploitation of animals for food. I use the word construct because it's very important to me. It's not good enough for us to just point out what's wrong. We have to be actively working to solve the problem and constructing a better food system. And that's important to keep in mind today as we tear apart what I think is a very valid solution that we should not be throwing away at this early stage in its development. So why are we all here? Let's just remember that, because that was a heated exchange, I would say. We're all here for the same reason. Hope brought us all here for the same reason. We all are trying to stop this. Because as a reminder, there are nearly 80 billion farmed animals that move through our food system, and that's just land, that's not sea animals, those are not water animals, that are in systems like this that are atrocious. And we're in crisis mode now. We're at an urgent point in our history because guess what? This is not working very well. More people are eating animals than ever before in history. More animals are being slaughtered than ever before in history. That is the reality that we have to keep in mind, and we have to keep in mind for the animals that I just showed you. That's a fact, and that trend has not changed, and in fact, it's exponential. And there are two reasons for that. One is this, human population growth. By 2050, we predict there will be, the United Nations predicts, there will be 10 billion people on the planet. That's not slowing down. That's not stopping. We, that's not what we're here to debate or try to stop. That's going to happen. 10 billion people, and they all need to eat. And what's more, second trend, is that there's undernourishment is decreasing. Across the world, people are living higher qualities of life, and that's a great thing for human beings. And in some countries, that's really pronounced, like China and Brazil. 
where childhood mortality is dropping off a cliff. We've stayed pretty steady, but in some countries where, by the way, the population is rising astronomically, they're also having higher quality of life. And comes with that, the unintended consequence, the negative consequence, is that people are eating more meat. And this is why. More animals are being slaughtered than ever before in history. So by that thought, we are failing miserably at doing our job, Bruce and I, as activists. And we are hopeless optimists, is why we're still here, we're still working. Because we believe we can change it. And I think that's why you all are here today, too. But we have to keep in mind these real figures, these cold, hard numbers that we're faced with. Because if population increases as it's set to increase, the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations says that we're going to have to more than double the number of animals in factory farms to meet this demand. This is not my figure. This is the United Nations. So we did a math problem. We said, what if we modestly, modestly, because we want zero, right? But what if we modestly wanted to half the number of farmed animals that are slaughtered today by 2050, given the rising population? So we want to go from 74 billion to 37 billion, let's say. What would that mean per person? Would it mean half the number of farmed animals per person? No, because there's going to be so many more humans on the planet. What it would mean is 10%. That would mean everybody in the United States today would have to eat 90% less of what they eat today to get us to only half the number of farmed animals today by 2050. What's, it's realistic for us to look... Oh, so this is, around the world, it's very similar. So, I know, cute picture for a second, so we can just have a cute picture moment to make us happy again. <clears throat> Oceana, the same thing, which is where Asia is housed. Brazil, Latin America, 80, they're all the same. They all have to make, do major reductions, 90%, just to get us to half, just to get us to 37 billion, which is totally unacceptable, Right? And, okay, so let's think, okay, what, what's been happening in the last 20 years in terms of meat consumption or vegetarianism, plant-based? It's not good. Actually, a Gallup poll recently showed that it stayed the same. Over 20 years in the United States, it's been at 6%. It hasn't changed. So, again, something's not right in the way that we're approaching this problem. So let's review. 10 billion people on the planet by 2050. They're going to have higher standards of living, and we're going to have to more than double the number of animals to meet that demand. To reduce the number of farmed animals by even half, an American would have to eat 90% less of what they eat today, but vegetarianism has stayed around 5 to 6% over the last 20 years in this country. So what should our approach be? What should we do? This is what I think about every day in my job, what Bruce thinks about every single day as activists. We are thinking, how do we stop this trend? Now, our opponents might try to tell you that this is, clean meat is the holy grail for us, that we think this is the only answer. We're going to throw all our resources. We're giving up on everything else. It is not true. But clean meat didn't exist only a few years ago. We're in the first stages of developing this. Should we throw it out right now? Forget it? Should we say no to this, obviously, uh, a technology that has a great amount of potential? Is clean meat bad for animals? Absolutely not. It doesn't harm one animal in the process, given its full potential. And is it something that is the answer to stopping the exploitation of animals for food? Maybe, it might be, or maybe not, but we shouldn't stop now. And is it good for animals? Absolutely, it's worth exploring, but so are all of these to continue doing. All of these things we do. There's not one answer, and I think we get into this idea of there's one hero to the story of ending factory farming. 
but there's not one hero. We're all part of this story. And all of the options that we're exploring, we have to support. And our opponent also talked about stopping consumption of all meat. But what is meat? Meat as a word is a social construct that we created, that we decided comes from a slaughtered animal. Our opponents might say that meat shouldn't be eaten, even if it comes from an animal that was never slaughtered, that was never harmed, that was never alive. So should we reject it for that reason? Because it comes originally from a system of injustice and exploitation? Well, it turns out that we can reassign things at any time, and we are doing so, and we have done so. And the industry feels really threatened by this and confused, and they're conflicting internally about this. They don't know what to do. We have the Cattlemen Association who are throwing petitions to stop us from redefining meat as a word because this is super threatening to them where we're saying, you don't get to decide what meat is. We do, and it doesn't come from a slaughtered animal. And companies like Cargill are thinking, I got to stay in business in the future. They're not doing out of malintent. I work with these companies. They're just caring about the bottom line. And if we can convince them that the bottom line can come from an animal that was never slaughtered, they're like, thumbs up. That's all they care about. They don't care about animals. They don't really care about consumers. They care about money. Right? And if we can make it so that it just makes money, they're all for it. And Cargill proved that. Cargill renamed their meat department. They re Just listen. They renamed their meat department to be a protein department. <laughs> because they're preparing for the future. They know this is where we are headed. Where this word and protein, we're in a protein revolution right now. Where this word is changing. And is there any history that, where we reassigned a word? And to do that, I have to tell you the story, the tale of the two Henrys. Has anybody heard the tale of the two Henrys before? Oh, good. Does anybody know who is on the left or on the right? Henry Ford, OK. On the left is Henry Berg. Henry Berg is the founder of the ASPCA. And Henry Ford made cars. So Henry Berg, in 1863, he was an American diplomat. And he went over to Russia, and he saw this driver beating a fallen horse. And he got out and he stopped him. And right then and there, he realized he was an activist and he could do something to change the world. He went back to the United States and in 1866, he founded the ASPCA with the primary focus of protecting those horses, of stopping the abuse and cruelty towards horses used for the simple thing that humans needed, transportation from A to B. But his dream was really accelerated really driven home when Henry Ford came up with a car. Henry Ford very famously said, if I had asked my customers what they wanted, they would have said a faster horse. I gave them a car. And it was the car, it was this vehicle, this transportation innovation that led to the near end of the use of horses for transportation. Because human beings were going to continue to need transportation from A to B and demand that. And as population grew and our world grew smaller, they still wanted to get from A to B and they still needed it. And that's the... S you have 12 minutes. Okay, I'm out my last one. So, in this same way, where the abused horse is now the forgotten ancestor of our modern car, one day, with any hope of this technology working, the burger or the farmed animal that is slaughtered will just be the distant memory, the ancestor, the forgotten ancestor of the burger. And cell-based meat will have helped us get there, hopefully. And farmed animals will thank us for not stopping to explore every avenue, take every option, because of those astronomical numbers we are up against. Thank you.
our resident pirate, John Sanbanmatsu. Thank you, Hope. Thank you, Hope, and thank you, Karen, for having me here. I'm going to speak very quickly because I have about 20 minutes I'm combining into 10. Um, I get it. I, you know, uh, we have some courageous activists on the stage, and I get that after so many years of frustration with people uh, eating more meat, more animal suffering, we see something uh, bright and shiny and new, a high-technology item, something that has the backing of a lot of very powerful, rich white men. Uh, so it must be award-winning, kind of like the film Green Book, right? Well, my message for you today, my message for you today is that all that glitters is not gold. Sometimes under further scrutiny, it turns out to be fool's gold, which has all, actually none of the properties of real gold, but all of the sheen. Geologists call that pyrite, which is why I have come dressed as a pyrite myself <laughs> tonight. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the land of make-believe, where the Good Food Institute tells us that the two forces which have destroyed most animal life on the earth, which are capitalism and the meat economy, the meat industry, are going to, guess what, be the solution to saving the animals. It would be funny, it would be funny if it wasn't um, uh, horrifying. So I have many different arguments to make. Uh, the main one is that synthetic meat is an opportunity for the meat industry to diversify its markets and to ensure its long-term survival, including of its... Um, I need the clicker. Where's the clicker? Yeah. So don't time me for that. <laughs> We've been in heated uh, negotiations about time here. Um, clean meat is part of a strategy not to replace animal agriculture, but to enshrine the meat economy forever. Oh, by the way, so this, you'll be able to, uh, I'll show the slide later. We are putting together a website, thecleanmeathoax.com. All right. Now, my first point is that clean meat strengthens meat culture. Synthetic meat reinforces meat culture as a whole. As Justin Van Cleek points out, quote, the problem with clean meat is that it keeps meat as a concept on the plate. The continued preponderance of meat will therefore mean that real meat will always have a cultural cachet that nothing else will. I think that aestheticizing meat as an attractive commodity is a terrible idea. Consumers are being thrust into a twilight zone of ontological ambiguity. Is it real or is it Memorex? Is it real meat or is it real meat? Who can say? <laughs> Much of the public relations and marketing discourse around clean meat actually reinforces myths about meat. The idea that animal flesh is essential, indispensable, inevitable, irreplaceable, natural, something we need rather than merely want. When Bruce was interviewed on Vox, his interviewer said, quote, you often hear that eating animals is natural, and it is, but not the way we do it. Bruce, unfortunately, did not correct the interviewer, but in fact, it is not natural. It's a historical cultural artifact, as Leah was saying. Meat is even being depicted as aesthetically beautiful. Here's how the Israeli synthetic meat startup Aleph Farms, a beneficiary of one of Bruce's two venture capitalist firms. He's too, you're too modest, Bruce. You talked about your nonprofit work, not the fact that you are principal in uh, two venture capitalist firms to produce and profit from this. Um, uh, Aleph Farms, excuse me. Totally, totally not true. Well, um, Aleph Farms. Sorry, we will but white people are like, oh, no, it's well, well, just not true. Well, Yes, debate later. Uh, one, of the, one of the firms that's profiting from these capital venture firms is Aleph Foods, which says, quote, we believe meat is one of life's pleasures to be celebrated and enjoyed, but without the downsides to health and the environment. Finally, meat you can enjoy that's good for your health and good for the planet. So, two messages. One, meat is one of life's essential pleasures. Two, you should eat the new meat for health and the environment. And my friends, it's not about the animals in most of the uh, discourse, or the advertising. It's an anti-vegan discourse. The animals barely get mentioned a lot of the time in many of the presentations, as though they're an embarrassment. It's doing the opposite of what we want to do, which is try to get people to actually care about animals, not to trivialize them. But Bruce himself says, Bruce himself says that the whole point of clean meat is, quote, to take ethics off the table for the consumer. But taking ethics off the table subverts animal justice and damages the long-term interests of both animals and our movement. Secondly, uh, clean meat is not intended to replace animal agriculture. Neither the Good Food Institute nor the venture capitalist firm's new crop capital or clear current capital are against animal agriculture. Quote, 
Our team views conventional animal agriculture as an antiquated and inefficient food production system. And Bruce himself said at a debate, quote, I understand the concern of people in slow food, and we're absolutely not trying to make people unhappy about, you know, animal farms. I would be completely shocked if the fact that clean meat is being promoted, if that had any negative ramifications for the folks in the regenerative animal agriculture, slow food, high welfare crowd. And in fact, to the degree that clean meat is successful, it replaces conventional animal agriculture. We see Tyson, Smithfield, and everybody else go to clean meat. And then the options are uh, clean meat on one hand and then uh, the sort of regenerative high welfare meat on the other. So, so it's a reducing the future to these two possibilities. Quote, so I don't see them in competition at all. I don't think there are any real negative ramifications for high welfare regenerative agriculture. Just as a reminder... This is what um, high welfare animal agriculture looks like. Camus Davis, of course, you know, the local hunting, hunting people, and all the animals end up in these slaughterhouses anyway. This is high welfare, and these people basically get a pass. Make no mistake, this is an anti-animal justice position. It is a welfare position. It is not an abolitionist one. The clean meat lobby has set up a, a false dilemma, a choice between conventional animal agriculture on one side and new synthesized animal flesh on the other. What we need is, an, is a choice between animal agriculture and animal-free agriculture. This, by the way, is an intensification of humane meat discourse, um, which I've written on. Uh, we don't have, don't have time to go into it. Bruce has uh, been a promoter of that. I think humane meat and the, the myth that animals can be uh, killed, gassed, shot, stabbed in the billions or millions uh, ethically is horrific and has done great damage uh, to our movements. Clean meat won't eliminate meat from animals killed on factory farms either. So I, I agree with my um, partner in this, Vasily, uh, who quoted uh, Bruce as saying, for the Good Food Institute, we have really good relationships with Tyson, Smithfield, Purdue, and so forth, and says that the people who run these companies want to do something noble. They want to uh, feed the world high-quality protein. That's their goal. But as Leah said, it isn't their goal. They have one goal. It isn't to feed the world. It's to make profit. And if they're going to kill billions and billions of animals to do that, they'll do that. So that much of the argument uh, is clear. Well, James Levesque, over a decade ago, wrote this really great article. You should look up online. It's called Invasion of the Movement Snatchers. And it's about how the meat industry is taking over the vegan movement and the animal rights movement, believe it or not. Um, so you have, just in the last few years, you have um, all of these companies now taking over the uh, vegan foods industry. In 2016, the Danone Fair, uh, sorry, dairy company in France bought White Wave and Silk Soy Milk. In 2017, Field Roast and Light Life, the vegan meat companies, were purchased by Maple Leaf Foods, the biggest killer of animals in Canada. Whoops. So this is Maple Leaf Foods. In 2017, the Daya Cheese Company was purchased by the Otsuka Pharmaceutical Company, the second biggest big pharma in Japan, which, of course, tests on animals. Last year, uh, Good Catch, which is one of the uh, companies that Bruce has promoted, I believe, raised $8.7 half, uh, $8 million in new funding, including from the PHW Grupa Lohman Company. Who are they? one of Europe's uh, largest poultry producers. They killed 350 million chickens just last year. Meanwhile, thanks to these uh, capital investment firms, uh, the biggest meat companies are now buying into synthetic meat. Tyson and Cargill are investing in uh, Memphis meats, and, and um, it could give you many other examples. So why are companies uh, doing this? Why are they uh, gobbling up the vegan industry? Well, I want to concur with uh, my debate partner here. First of all, there's ve uh, vegan washing and green washing. These companies are able to put a compassionate label, sustainability label on their products. Secondly, they are hedging against future risk by buying up vegan enterprises. They gain strategic growing influence and advantage over the vegan market and the animal rights movement. They're defining our discourses for us, and now here we are, as though summoned. Three, it's about the money to ensure future market dominance through a two-track strategy to preserve and, where possible, to expand traditional live animal markets. It is quite clear these companies have no intention ever of ending animal agriculture. Uh, now, it's possible that if they could do it cheaply and so forth, um, 
that, that is a possibility, but I think it's an extremely remote one. Here's what Cargill said. Now, they're an investor in uh, Memphis Meats. Quote, Cargill is committed to growing our protein portfolio. This includes investing in and growing our traditional animal protein businesses. Our commitment is reinforced by nearly $600 million in recent investments in conventional protein, meaning factory farming, in North America alone, including acquisition of five-star custom foods, modernization of our turkey hatchery in Virginia, the conversion of our Columbus, Nebraska plant into a cooked meats facility, and on and on and on. They say, this underscores... This further underscores Cargill's overarching commitment to animal protein. At Cargill, we, Cargill, we recognize that, that meat is a core part of consumer diets, central to many cultures and traditions. Our traditional proteins, as well as new innovations like cultured meats, are both necessary to meet that demand. What Leah didn't mention is that, no, the, the desire for meat is not natural. It's actually marketed. And these companies, like Cargill, spend billions of dollars to make people want to buy the meat. So it's not, it's, it's the creating the demand. Um, and these are the people who we're supposed to uh, trust. And we see the same thing with uh, the Danone company, a two-pronged uh, two strategy, a, a dual-track strategy. There is room for dairy alternatives and milk products. Our data shows that both milk alternatives as well as dairy products can transform, can perform well and not necessarily take share from one another. That, in turn, suggests that consumers can be swayed either way. So... Um, Basically, this is how the future looks to Maple Farms. They're going to have ham, and then they're going to have field roast, you know, vegan. They're going to preserve this. this is, they, there's no intention. There's nothing that suggests they're going to get away, with it, uh, get away from it. The introdu introduction of a, uh, a verisimilitude in a commodity does not have anything to do with, you know, how the, it changes uh, mar uh, consumption. Faux fur has been, uh, you know, around for decades, and guess what? Fur consumption is increasing. I've never seen so much fur. The, this is actually fake fur. This has not replaced real fur, just as the, the meat, the synthetic meat, is not going to replace the other meat. It's going to go, come right along with it. Now, uh, last thing I wanted to say, almost the last thing, is that uh, the clean meat is the strategy of robbing Peter to pay Paul, and Vasily touched on this. But if you buy, say, uh, recycled paper as I do from Georgia Pacific, you're actually supporting Coke Enterprises, which is to say the Coke brothers who own Georgia Pacific. So every time we uh, do try to do the right thing and buy a field roast burger, we're actually supporting factory farming. Cargill, which has been come up, come up for praise, is one of the leading companies involved in deforestation, right? The uh, homelessness of orangutans and others. And finally, it's not going to work. If you take ethics off the table, there's no longer a compelling reason to buy the synthetic meats in the first place. And as Vasily said, they're not, it's not even clear it's that sustainable. And basically, you're going to leave consumers with the choice. Do they want the real thing, or are they going to want the synthetic thing? Well, especially if they're comparably priced, they're going to want the real thing most of the time, or half the time, or a quarter of the time, whatever. But we're talking about billions and billions and billions of animals. So the last thing I wanted to say is then what is all of this about, you know, fundamentally? And I think it really is about this, actually. <laughs> you know, I really do. What's a, what's a pirate? No, I have a two sentences, two sentences. So the new meats lobby, including these venture capitalist firms, are going to make their investors a ton of money. As the new crop capital's chief investment officer, Chris Kerr, said, quote, we will be rich no matter what. That's a direct quote. Bruce, from Chris Kerr. We will be rich no matter what. We are being treated as fools. They get the gold, and the animals lose. Thank you. Okay. Wow. <laughs> Lively. Um, so I'm feeling like... I was going to get right into questions, but I want to check in with the panel, and I wonder if... Um, either side would like to just have five minutes to respond to what was said. Um, it feels... <laughs> feels, like, feels like we might want to clear up a little bit. I don't know. Uh, I just saw a lot of frantic notes being taken and all that. So, <laughs> so um, is it, is it, does any side want to take just five minutes to respond to anything that was said? Bruce. Go ahead. So... Uh... For people who don't know, um, I was at People for the Ethical Treatment of Animals for 15 years, um, vice president of campaigns for PETA. I put together the Meet Your Meat video 
put together the Paul McCartney Glass Walls video. Um, what I expected to be discussing was what John said. Uh, that was pretty much what I assumed both sides would say. Um, I just want to say PETA came out in favor of and has been vigorously supportive of clean meat uh, for probably 15 years since it was just sort of a pipe dream um, and has continued to be uh, vigorously supportive. I'm not familiar with any animal rights organization that has come out against it. The Humane League has come out in favor. Mercy for Animals has come out in favor. Animal Equality has come out in favor. The Humane Society has come out in favor. Um, if anything that Vloss said in his first 12 minutes were true, um, none of those organizations would have come out in favor of it. None of them. So you either have to believe that, you know, Ingrid and David and Leah and me, who's dedicating my life to this, um, either uh, were willing to sacrifice animals for the greater good, which we're not, um, or we're stupid, which we're not, um, or we didn't do due diligence and just didn't realize all the things that he said, which isn't the case. Um, all of the organizations, and I, and Leah, um, did due diligence on the technology, and really just none of it's true. Um, so that's the first thing to say. I am just uh, in the interest of sort of settling everything, uh, going to just sort of knock down each of the things to tell you what, the, what our position is. Um, does it harm the planet? Well, the LCA that he um, said the in vitro meat industry had funded uh, came out in 2011, and the in vitro meat industry uh, raised its first $50,000 in 2015, um, and so had not existed for four years at that point. There really isn't an in vitro meat industry. I mean, the, so in vitro, the, the clean meat companies so far have raised about $70 million, some total across all of them. Uh, very little of that so far has come from the meat industry, although we're optimistic that a lot more will. Um, the LCAs that exist, I do agree with him that they, there aren't many of them and they aren't very good. What are uh, oh, I'm sorry, life cycle analyses. Um, impact yeah, the environment, the environmental impact assessments, I apologize. Um, but the study that he cited, which I was really very surprised by, the study where he said the CO2 requirements of clean meat are so high and consequently clean meat will actually be worse for the environment. Um, this is a study that came out maybe three weeks ago, um, and it said at the thousand year mark, um, in one of the four scenarios that they studied, starting in 800 years, clean meat will be worse than industrial animal meat. Uh, but the main point that the Good Food Institute has made, and if you Google the Good Food Institute, um, and life cycle analyses, or my name, and life cycle analyses, or if you just go to gfi.org up slash blog, I think it's like three or four blogs down, you'll see our analysis of this. It's a little bit like predicting the life cycle, the, the environmental impact of something like an iPhone 10 years before there was an iPhone. Uh, basically what's happening is that we are extrapolating from medical therapies, which is what tissue engineering is being used for now, um, taking that process applying it to food and saying that's the best it's going to get, uh, which is, you know, simply not the case. It really is like, and, and the price thing is like attacking the iPhone in 2012. Both um, Voss and John said both it's not going to work, it's not going to save animals, um, and it's going to make the meat industry insanely profitable. You kind of have to choose between those two things, it seems to me. I'll give you one more minute, Bruce. Okay. Um, Oh, fetal bovine ceremony. You can, you can Google... That's going to be my first question, so okay. if you've got anything else. Okay. There are no animal experiments. Oh, yeah. I started two venture capital funds by recruiting the people who run them, uh, both Chris Kerr and Kurt Albright. The guys who run the two venture capital firms are longtime animal rights activists, animal rights philanthropists, and vegans. Um, I have no... Uh, absolutely no. I'm not a principal. I have absolutely no interest in either of them, although I am an advisor to both of them. Um, the idea of ethics off the table, I mean, that's just we want meat not to be associated with animals. We want people, when they are eating meat, like when people take insulin now, does anybody think people shouldn't take synthetic insulin? We want, we want to take ethics off the table. So when he says not clean meat but no meat, I mean, the main thing I want to say is how's that going for us, Right. How is that going? Highest per capita meat consumption 2018. 2019 is going to be even higher. Nobody has a scenario for how education turns back the clock. But 
Both of them said over and over, this is going to make the meat industry a ton of money. Um, and it probably will make the meat industry a ton of money because it's more efficient. So the idea that they're going to be doing 50-50 blends, you know, how many, more, how many horses and carrot, how many people are riding around by horse and carriage? How many phones are you taking um, not on your, how many um, pictures are you taking not on your digital camera? How much communication is happening with landlines? As this scales up, it's going to be less expensive. And the people, you know, maybe there are cattle ranchers and dairy farmers who like, actually like the fact that they're working with animals, but none of the executives at Tyson and Purdue and Smithfield and Hormel, like for none of them is the idea of factory farming and slaughterhouses the reason they get up in the morning. Like if you meet these people, they're like all of our families and friends who eat meat. You know, they really do want to provide high quality protein to the world. They went to business school. They got the job at Tyson or Purdue or Hormel. They could have just as easily been just about any place else. Um, and yes, okay, the capitalist have, of, uh, capitalistic have economy, which is what Bruce. I thought we were going to be talking about. This is how we get to animal liberation. This is how we take ethics off the table. This is how we meet, make meat harmless. And if we care about animals, think about the animals on the factory farms. Think about the animals in the slaughterhouses. Do you want 70% okay, more of them dead gonna, in 2050? I'm going to wrap you up, Bruce. Okay. Thank you. So I'm going to give this side one of you five minutes, and then we're going to get into questions, okay, to, to respond. This is, huh? Okay, that's fine. This is, this is a now response to what you heard uh, from the introductions. So, so let me just say one, one thing briefly. I, I just want everyone to know, I, I personally respect Bruce a great deal, and I think most people here do. And I'm, I'm just now meeting Leah, but I personally respect her, and I respect every animal rights organization out there. I respect every vegan out there. There's not that many of us. <laughs> no. And, yeah. I, you know, I disagree with this topic, and I think that there has been some mistakes that have been made. I don't people think that people are fundamentally different in their hearts. I'm just trying to highlight some information. So one part of information I'm trying to highlight is the preponderance of peer-reviewed research that has been done on in vitro meat. So you can go to the Good Food Institute. They have a white paper. So, and don't trust me, Google it on your phone. You can go Good Food Institute, white paper, clean meat. They cite three and a half studies in favor of the environmental benefit of clean meat. Very briefly, I'll go through them. So, the first one they cite is the one he mentioned from 2011. This is the only positive study. As earlier discussed, it was created by a graduate student, and that doesn't mean graduate students can't do great work. They do, but it does mean that there might be some mistakes that cropped in. It was funded by the in vitro meat industry, maybe that wasn't a precise term, but what happened is New Harvest, and you can Google New Harvest, take a look. They put out money and they said, hey, we wanna fund this study. Now, it's not the case that funding studies always makes bias, but there's better and worse ways to do it, and New Harvest did the worst possible one. They said, we have some money, and we are going to look at all the applications. And then after you've applied to us, we're gonna choose who does the studies and we're gonna choose which methodology we support. So that is the most amount of bias that you can interject into a study. And this was by an organization which explicitly wants to promote in vitro meat. That's who funded the study. If you take a look at the paper, it says it's funded by them at the bottom of the paper. It is also on their website. So this is not in debate. So, <clears throat> as I mentioned, the study had multiple thought, it wasn't an actual life cycle analysis because so it doesn't exist light. It had thought experiments. And I mentioned one that was untrue and we have time in the questions later. I can tell you how the other thought experiments were all not also possible. One of them included the statement that she didn't need to consider the energy that was needed for the bioreactors because cells make heat, even though that's actually one of the primary areas that the, produces GHG. So it's a flawed study. And then if I have time later in the questions, I can go through the rest of the white paper and explain to you how each of the studies they cite actually concludes that in vitro meat would be more harmful to the planet 
than, po- than all forms of chicken or pork and possibly beef. And Three certainly minutes. worse than any kind of plant-based alternative. Thank you. Don. Okay, thanks. Um, I just wanted to briefly comment on the horse thing because, uh, Bruce, I've seen you give that um, talk on your TED Talk and so we're making that point about horses. Uh, you mean the horse carriage? And yeah, and right. Horses car. transfer, you know, many, 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 many more animals have been killed and mutilated by Henry Ford's innovation than ever died uh, through the horse and carriage business. So you have to be aware, be aware of the unintended consequences of technology when they're in the hands of very powerful people and where there's no democratic accountability. Henry Ford, of course, who's being been kind of lionized here, was a notorious anti-Semite, you know, buddy, uh, very friendly with Hitler, uh, you know, treated the workers terribly, etc. cetera. Um, my point is that you can't, we can't just assume that a market mechanism is going to correct a moral problem. It won't. It hasn't. Capitalism has destroyed two-thirds of all animal life in the last 40 years, according to the World Wildlife Federation. They are being destroyed, being killed by this, this metastatic system. So to think, regardless of what the particular individual's moral character are at the head of Tyson and Purdue and so forth, I don't know these people, but I can tell you, just look at their record. Look at the undercover abuses by uh, uh, investigations by PETA and so forth of the uh, horrific abuses of animals by these companies. Are these people going to be trusted? No. What's going to happen is meat, per, meat consumption per capita is going to probably go up because they're going to market more of this stuff. And what I think is going to happen is that, yes, there'll be, there's potentially fewer animals suffering, but it's going to bottom out at a certain price point, and then you're going to have both uh, factory-farmed flesh available and the synthetic meat, and it's going to, and it's going to go on. And that's why uh, Vasily and I feel strongly that it's a mistaken strategy. You know, we're not, we're, we're not uh, impugning uh, motives here, but we are saying that it's a very mistaken strategy. All right, thank you. Okay, so we're going to get into some questions. We're um, really, I mean, it's, it's so fascinating and amazing, and, and we're, the, the time is just ticking away. So I want to get into... Um, the specific question of uh, the, you know, the concern with the um, embryonic, the, the fetal bovine serum, um, using that as the medium right now. Um, I've also heard that horse serum is used, chicken embryo extract, things like this. Um, I, I'm not sure how accurate that is, so I'm, I'm asking the panel. Um, and, you know, so what, basically what is the likelihood that this is going to continue um, I, I, I would hope that, you know, the, that we're working towards not using these, but right now it's the best process or the best media to use. Um, and, and you, you know, by the, uh, pro side's own admission, you know, these people aren't in it for the animals, a lot of them. Um, so how can we guarantee, you know, that, um, you know, that these things are, are going to move towards a more ethical vegan process and only use vegan uh, methods and medias? Um, and this kind of goes into one of the, uh, the panel or the audience's question that uh, says that I'm concerned about the animals who will be used for lab-grown meat. How will these animals live and be treated? Leah, do you want to start since you haven't spoken for a bit? Yeah. Um, well, I'm confused about the animals that are used because I don't, there was a, a great video that came out um, created by Just, and it was called Ian the Chicken. And did anybody see that video? Right? So the whole process was there was a chicken named Ian. A feather had fallen. They picked up the feather. They extracted the cell from the feather. And then they grew the meat from this fallen feather. Then they made a nugget. They ate the chicken while Ian was wandering around. Right? So there's no animal harmed in the process, in that process, right? And, and Bruce can answer this better than I can about the serum. So am I right that Memphis Meats, are any of the company, well, you probably should answer this question better about the serum. I'll let him answer the serum because the direction is we're not going to use bovine serum. And none of it is coming to market yet until it, the, nothing's on market. You can't purchase this anywhere. 
And all of the research is looking at a total plant-based solution to feed them. And none of these, that's, the, that's every company's objective right now, is to only use a plant-based serum. So the technology that they're borrowing is from cancer research, where of course they didn't think about that. And they are using bovine serum. And that's where the research they're borrowing. That's the knowledge to date. But all of the work is around finding a plant-based solution 100% and not using, nobody, none of us would, so do you think that Bruce and I, you know, we, collectively we have 40 years of animal rights activism between us. Would we be supporting that? Absolutely not. No way. And I also want to point out, there's been, you know, the heads of these companies, they don't really care about the animals. That is also not true. <laughs> The head of Memphis Meats is a vegan. He's a cardiologist. He cares deeply about animals. The head of Just is a vegan. He's an activist. He cares deeply about animals. They, the people who are starting these companies, I know them personally, care deeply about animals. I guess I was talking more about Big Ag and Tyson that's getting into it and Cargill. Right. Okay. Well, they're investing in it because it looks lucrative and they're threatened by this. And they only care about the bottom line. And they want to make sure they stay in business as the trend goes away from this. I also, I didn't put this in my slides, but there's a reality that those businesses are seeing, which is arable land is running out. So when we have a chicken, it's not just the environmental impact of raising that chicken in that spot. There's all of the soy and the grains that are being raised and we are running out of land, arable land. We, it's just a math problem. We literally cannot eat that much meat in the future but people are still demanding it. So we're just gonna run our planet into the ground if we don't come up with a solution. If you don't care about the animals, the future of our planet is not going in a good direction. And one other thing I just wanna say, well, I didn't get a chance to respond, yeah. is I get what it feels like to be angry about these things. Like, I really loved Renee's talk and I work, I've worked with you know, factory farmers turned activists and that's, uh, Bruce is going to. He, that she, she put, yes, Bruce is going to. She said that she didn't have the knowledge and is going to let Bruce answer it, and now she's making a response because she didn't get to speak earlier. So now she's responding to some of the things that were said earlier. We're going to get that, that response from Bruce. Go ahead, Lee. I promise that answer. And I did answer it. I said that plant-based serum is being looked at. That is where we're headed, is we're getting plant... And most of the companies are... That's all of their R&D is devoted to plant-based solution, not the bovine fetal solution. They're all looking at that. It's not the future. And I said that cancer research used bovine and all of the, the cancer research, the organ transplant research was all using the bovine serum. And that's where we started to get the science and the ideas to be able to do this. But that's not where we're going. And none of these companies are all looking at plant-based only serums. So maybe you'll just answer that. Well, no, Leah, please finish okay. what you were going to say. It's okay. Well, I would just say that... Um, I really get, like, I have been an angry activist for, like, 20 years, right? Where I'm just, like, beating my head. Like, I, the industry sucks. You know, they're not doing the right thing. It's, like, it feels good. Like, I think, Renee, you said angry doesn't change them. Like, we're not going to change anybody by being angry. We have to put ourselves in their shoes. We're not in charge of one animal, not one. Not one of us are in charge of those animals that Tyson are overseeing. So you have to put yourselves in Tyson's shoes and say, what's going to make them stop killing animals? Not like, I'm angry they're killing them, I'm angry they're capitalists, we could have a whole debate. We're not, ang we're not actually debating capitalism here today, I'd love to do that debate, but that's not the one for today, so let's just put that aside. But you have to, like, this is, this is my life, is trying to think about how do we stop Tyson from wanting to slaughter animals? And it's not going to be me sitting in the room yelling at them about be ethical. Why aren't you ethical? It's not working. Okay, one more minute? Or? That's it. Okay, great. All right, so Bruce. Yeah. So Bruce, in just about, if you can, in like three minutes, uh, let us know about that, the, um, you know, the bovine serum, like I've heard, chicken embryo extract, all these animal uh, products that I have heard are being used in this process. What's up with that? Well, I'm not familiar with chicken embryo extracts. Okay. Um, 
but uh, fetal bovine serum, I mean, you can get a longer explanation of FBS by Googling my name and FBS. Um, I have an article about why uh, this is, as Leah said, this is therapeutic supplied to food. Um, you have to test every single batch of FBS. FBS inclusion is part of the reason that the um, life cycle analysis, the environmental assessments uh, that, that uh, Voss was talking about um, are bad, which if you uh, read our white paper, it goes into why their extrapolations are not extrapolations to a technology that actually works. So it's certainly possible that um, when they said clean meat isn't going to work, that's certainly possible. We don't know if it's going to be able to scale up. Um, if it does scale up, it will be the exact same product and it will cost less, uh, which means that it'll be like you know insulin. Insulin is not used. Uh, it doesn't come from pigs anymore. Um, it used to come from pigs and we will just completely take away the idea that meat comes from animals. But uh, multiple companies are not using FBS now. Just isn't using FBS. Memphis Meats isn't using FBS. FBS is uh, fetal, bovine fetal, serum. Okay. Fetal, fetal bovine serum. Um, and as Leah said, um, all the companies want to move away from it as quickly as possible. It won't be used at commercialization. Really? Yeah. Yeah. FBS is FBS. Sorry. I mean, you do have to believe the companies. Um, so, I mean, it's, it's, I mean, you have to believe Just, which is run by vegans, and Memphis, which is run by vegans. Uh, but if you look at my paper, you can see what, um, just for what uh, Leah says, uh, which is just that FBS is extremely expensive, and there's no way clean meat works if FBS is an ingredient. It's one of the reasons that the environmental assessments um, are bad, you know, because they're scaling up with this assumption that they're going to keep using FBS. Uh, FBS is not allowed in a lot of medical in a lot of medical tissue engineering. It's absolutely not an essential ingredient. It just works really well for cell multiplication. So at bench scale, um, a lot of people in tissue engineering use it at bench scale, but when they're actually producing the products, they can't legally use it. Um, it's not allowed, and because these companies are run by vegans, uh, multiple of them have stopped using it because they have an ethical objection to it. Um, and then, as Leah said, um, all of them, you know, nobody's going to be using FBS when this stuff is being produced commercially. Um, uh, okay, we weren't going to do questions with the audience, but, but it's Karen, so yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, as you know, billions of acres of land are used just to grow crops to feed chickens and other uh, industrially raised animals. And uh, even compared to the heavily sprayed crops grown directly for human consumption, apart from organic, uh, these crops are very heavily sprayed, these mil millions and billions of acres in, in Brazil and the United States and everywhere else, with every type of pesticide, herbicide, fungicide, and you name it. So. What is the difference between growing all these crops and using all this uh, ener cropland energy and actual the whole resource uh, to feed actual living animals in the food industry versus feeding the um, the cellular versions in the vats? They still have to be fed, right? The cells have to be fed. The cells have to be fed. So, how could you do, address that? So, um, I mean, for people who want to dive into the technology of all of this, if you go to gfi.org um, up slash essentials, there are lots of white papers and other things that you can read. Um, the worst case scenario right now is that, so as probably most people in this room know, it takes nine calories fed to a chicken to get one calorie back out in the form of chicken flesh, according to the World Resources Institute. So that means nine times as much land, nine times as much water, nine times as much, you know, everything. Um, even with the current technology, without improving anything at all, um, it's three calories in for one calorie back out. Uh, but we have, so it's three times as efficient, so three times fewer, um, even for chicken. Cell -based, the cell-based. The cell-based, yeah. Of the cell. Yeah, exactly. Um, so relative to, relative to cattle, it's like 95 to 99% less land, even with no improvement on the current technology. Um, it's like so much less land. So one of the critiques that we make of those uh, environmental assessments is that it assumes that none of that land um, is repurposed in a positive way 
for example, for clean energy. And this is one of the things that the Gates Foundation talks about when they talk about being enthusiastic about clean meat. Uh, but we do have a, a cost assessment paper in the clean meat section on gfi.org up slash essentials that sort of walks through uh, media recycling, so nutrient recycling, which could make this more and more and more efficient. And obviously, because the companies are uh, profit motive driven, they have incentive to make it as efficient as possible. Um, so it should get more and more and more efficient. So it's way more efficient than, it's three, you know, 300% more efficient than chicken, even more efficient relative to, relative to uh, pig, killing pigs and cattle. Okay. Okay. So believe it or not, we are four minutes away from where we need to give everyone their closing statements. <laughs> And I have eight more questions I wanted to ask. <laughs> I, I, well, I, need I have to several to the FBS, questions. The FBS, if that's okay. Did you want to respond? Please. All right, let's give a couple of minutes to respond, and then I want to get, get at least one more of my questions in. Yeah. So uh, the, the idea that there are no longer uh, startup companies of in vitro meat, which are using FBS, is untrue. He is correct that Just Foods has stated that they have developed a plant-based uh, growth medium, which no longer uses FBS. Uh, they are also correct that Memphis Meat has claimed that they have developed one, but they haven't actually produced the um, uh, product yet. So they don't have like, uh, they haven't actually grown it, but they, they think they might have a medium. Uh, all the others do. For example, Finless Foods recently reassured us that they had decreased their use of FBS by 50%. Uh, since they won't tell us how much FPS they used to use, they won't tell us how much FPS they currently use, and they won't tell us even what their new growth medium is, it's hard to be reassured. Uh, there are two other deeper points I'd make quickly. Uh, as vegans, uh, we don't believe that it is okay to use animals and torture them and experiment them, even if there's a claim that it's going to help animals later. You heard the earlier talk. All animal experimentation makes this claim. If you go to any of the websites today, just look what's on the website. It says we're experimenting to help animals. So I don't think it's acceptable to be using FPS, even if the claim is later on, it might help animals. Who knows? We can't predict the future. I can tell you today those fetuses are being taken out and hurt. The second thing I would say, and this goes to how we can't predict the future, Look, I kind of like and trust the people in charge of Just. I kind of like and trust the people in charge of Memphis. But Tyson just invested in Memphis to an undisclosed amount of money. I don't like or trust Tyson. If FPS works and Tyson has a virtually unlimited amount of FPS, once they own the startup, what's to stop them from using it even if a different plant-based alternative is there? There's a plant-based alternative to the meat already. So why wouldn't they just recycle their own cow blood, their own FBS? And then as activists, I already have the problem of trying to explain, here's a factory farm, what about humane meat? Here's humane meat, what's what's really going on? Now my burden in addition to that is to be like, well, there's clean meat, well, this is the vegan clean meat, and this is the FBS being leaked, what's FBS? Final point, why are you only hearing about FBS now from me? Okay, so I, I, have a, a, I feel like this is just so riveting and everyone is wanting more um, and feeling they want more. Yeah, so what I'm going to propose is that we maybe don't have the 10-minute break between, if that's okay, and if you've got to go and go to the bathroom and get whatever, do, do whatever you need to do. Um, but maybe not having the 10-minute break and being able to take this into that 10-minute break and then we'll just go right in to the larger question and answer and bring the other speakers on. Would that be acceptable? We continue this. I feel like people are wanting that. Okay. Can I just... <laughs> we, we, will, uh, we will have to break momentarily to bring the other speakers up. Yes. Give me a minute. Okay. All right. Yes. Well, let me, I'm going to ask my question, I think. Okay? Um, and, and I have a lot of questions, um, but I think this one is the one for me that, that is, is um, really, really important. And the thing that I keep coming back to with all this, the thing that um, is my biggest concern, I would say, and that is that um, basically this 
technology could could potentially just you know it, it, it certainly continues the commodification of farmed animals. Um, okay, and you can okay. So, does it? Let me rephrase my. I'll ask the question: Does it continue the commodification of farmed animals? Um, the concern that, um, you know, is this going to hinder the concept of animal liberation, creating um, a status, you know, the status that anim animals have a fundamental right to live free of human commodification and exploitation, i.e. animal rights? Um, does this reinforce the fundamental paradigms of oppression and domination that animals are just here for our use? It's still meat. Um, so will this help to dismantle speciesism? Um, that's, that's the part that, that I keep coming back to. And if we don't establish these concepts, is there potential for exploitation in the future? And I'll, I'll just conclude with a quote. Um, I wrote, I, I read, I didn't write it. I wrote, I read, sorry. <laughs> Jeez. I read a really wonderful book recently um, called uh, The End to Animal Farming by J.C. Reese. And J.C. is, yeah, it's a great book. Um, and he is very pro-cell-based meat and has an entire uh, um, chapter uh, promoting cell-based meat, getting excited about cell-based meat. But at the end of this chapter, he had this quote. If society does end animal farming with technology for the sake of efficiency alone, but fails to develop compassion for farmed animals and other sentient beings, then our descendants might inflict similar abuses in the future comparable to factory farming. Such tragedies could be even greater in scale as future humans will likely have greater techno technological capacity. So I think what I'm talking about is that we need to have uh, uh, an underlying end of speciesism uh, not just another meat product. Okay, so, yeah. Um, and I, 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 you guys have been, go I think I'm going to let this side start, and then you can respond. How much time? Oh, I don't know. How about four minutes? Okay, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so, Leah, you said we're not here debating capitalism, and I, I disagree. I mean, the, the whole thing, everything that's going on within the matrix of capitalism, the same people who brought us colonialism, slavery, two great world wars, and as I said, the destruction of all animals on earth. And also, by the way, factory farming, and et cetera, et cetera. That's the context. And so, yes, of course, this is going to preserve the commodification of animals. Um, now, um, yeah, I, don't, I can't say what, anything about the character of the person who's running Just Foods. Let's say he's a great guy. Well, I don't know who started Field Roast, but weren't they great people? And what about, uh, you know, Ben and Jerry's? Well, they're taken over by Unilever. That's the problem with the capitalist system. You have to look at this as a structural organism. So if you, if I don't buy Ben and Jerry's vegan ice cream because I'm then supporting their exploitation of cows. All that money goes into one coffer. And has, has the alternative, has the vegan um, growth of the vegan uh, uh, ice cream uh, at ben and, ben and Jerry's hurt their dairy, uh, Ben and Jerry's? No, it's just, it's absurd. And so I don't think we're picking nits here. I think these are very uh, profound economic, social, political issues uh, that are at stake. And, and again, I, so I, I agree with, or you did, not to agree with you, but I, I think the answer to your question is yes, that the commodification of animals will continue and this doesn't touch speciesism. Now, if it was the case that the people running the show were going around showing people what animal suffering is like, explaining what speciesism is, explaining how it ties into aquaria and zoos and laboratory experimentation and structural violence against animals in the, on the transportation industry, the destruction of all ecosystems, all the fresh water systems just being destroyed. You know what I'm saying? If the public was being educated, their consciousness was being raised about what speciesism is as a mode of production of human life, then I could per perhaps get on board with this. But it, that's not how the messaging is going to work. And you can bet that Cargill and all these other companies who end up buying out just in five years when they have their IPO, and you bet, when I said it's not going to work, it is going to work probably as a technical matter, but it's not going to work in terms of replacing animals. That's my concern. So you can bet that when, when uh, Cargill takes over just in a few years, they are, they'll, they'll sell it on the sustainability grounds, whether it's sustainable or not, it's just as they now claim. Smithfield claims to be um, the leader in animal care. Did you know that? Smithfield claims to be the leader in animal care. And you find these same claims by Tyson and Purdue and all of them. 
that's capitalism. So it just seems to me, seconds. it just seems to me that, that I don't think we're just being like angry, you know, cranks to say, look, whoa, look at the history of this process and look at how the stuff is being marketed now. It's a real problem. And, and again, it's just going to, we have, as Vasily said, we have so many fantastic, delicious, sustainable uh, alternatives to animal products. We don't need synthetic meat. And why don't you get Bill Gates to, to, to just promote veganism, for God's sakes, right? Okay. Sure. My turn? Yes. How long do I have? Uh, three minutes. I get less than him? Four minutes. <laughs> I, there's just so little time. <laughs> it's all right. It's been happening. Um, just on the, the commodification point, um, I think everybody knows that Mercy for Animals doesn't actually work on cell-based meat. We're not out there as entrepreneurs trying to create it. We're an animal rights organization, and we are out there protesting in front of McDonald's, and we're doing undercover investigations. Um, to be really clear, we're not saying stop doing those things. We're not saying stop being activists and arguing for spe- you know, to, to take apart and look at this speciesism issue. Um, and these companies are not being, these are not just coming out of nowhere. They're not, nothing exists in a vacuum. These technologies are not c- existing or being created in a vacuum. They're being created because of pressure. Pressure that activists are creating, pressure the environment is creating, pressure human population is creating, and we're going to keep doing that. I think that it's, it's fundamentally important that we don't throw out any possible solution right now. When, especially when, as Bruce said, the first company was created in 2015. It's really soon. It's really early. And just keep in mind what I said before, there's only 5 to 6% vegetarians right now in the United States, and that hasn't changed for 20 years, and every day more animals are being killed. So, you know, I, we have to be careful as people who care so much about this, that we just, we don't live in our bubble, and we don't continue to just think, we're just going to be, stand on our, our principles, and we're just going to be angry about this. Just think, if you were in the room with Tyson, and you had the chance to talk to them, and this was your one shot, really, put your self in their shoes and what would convince Tyson executives to change just think about that right and right now it's not working what we've been doing and we've got to invite other opportunities we've really got to try to invite other opportunities so yes they're investing in plant-based and that's great and we're doing that too but why would we throw out this option as well Uh, and I think that I'll just close by saying It's not about do we like it, but does it work? What will work? What will stop animals from being slaughtered? And that's what we have to remember. Do you want to continue? Because there's still still four minutes. I mean, you've got some time. (laughs) One in a minute and a little. I really, I mean, I really do think, uh, I mean, obviously all of us resonate not with the phrase not clean meat, but no meat. Obviously, all of us would like to see Bill Gates go vegan as a solution. Um, a lot of people in this room would probably like to see capitalism fall. Um, <laughs> but if, I, if what we have to do is convince Bill Gates to go vegan and capitalism to fall in order to be successful, I mean, I guess, you know, sort of like uh, what Leah just said, framed a slightly different way, um, why can't we create clean meat and do whatever work we want to do to convince Bill Gates to go vegan um, and to work against capitalism. If this is successful, and John just said he thinks it'll be technically successful, uh, because it's so much more efficient than the current method of making meat, um, it will be extremely profitable. And it will take us from 9 billion animals per year, just land animals per year in the United States, uh, to very close to zero. It'll take us from tens of billions to very close to zero Um, animals exploited because all of the profit motive goes in this direction. So I haven't heard anything from the other side. I mean, I I haven't heard them attempt to argue that what we're doing now is working. Like we need to crush capitalism and we need to convince Bill Gates to go vegan. Um, Both of those things, things seem unlikely to me, but 
you can work for both of those things while you also try to convince Tyson and Cargill and the entire meat industry uh, to put its business acumen four minutes. Um, in this direction instead of the other direction. Um, on the precise question that you asked, Tobias Leinhart wrote a book called How to Create a Vegan World. Yeah, it's a really good book. Um, and in his book, How to Create a Vegan World, one of the things he points out um, is that it really is. I mean, if you look at the Faunalytics study, it's not 6% vegetarian in the U.S., it's 2% vegetarian. It's probably about a half a percent vegan um, in, the, in the United States. And one of the things that he says is inhibiting animal liberation is the fact that 98 or, you know, 94 or 96% of people, when they sit down to eat, they're literally dining on the corpses of tortured animals, which makes the cognitive dissonance over the moon. If we can remove the idea that meat comes from an animal, if we can grow meat directly from cells, much like insulin no longer comes from animals, if we can do that, we can open people up to the idea of animals as individuals. They all feel pain in the same way and to the same degree that we do. They're all made of flesh and blood and bone, yeah, just like we are. The argument is overwhelming for animal liberation, but because people eat the tortured corpses of animals, a lot of people aren't able to hear it. This is the solution to that as well, too. This gets us closer to animal liberation. All right. Okay, so if we do want to do five-minute closing statements per speaker, we'd need to start that now. Is that what we want to do? I feel like everybody wants to ask questions. I'd rather give my time to people to ask How do you, your side feel? I, I have a short closing statement, but why don't you all go? We can start with your question. Um, okay, well, I, okay. I, 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 we're going to open up to the, to the audience questions when we bring the other speakers on. Um, this was going to be for... I've done a great deal of research on this, and I was... I do. <laughs> um, I, I, I did. And, I mean, it, you know... And, and, and it's interesting because I, I got all of everyone's questions that were written down. That's why I, I had people write the questions. And almost every single thing that people said, I had in my questions. You know, so... I'm going to, I'm going to get, I was going to get to everybody's stuff, but anyway, um, well, let's go with one more question then. Um, and then maybe we'll see where we are and, uh, John can give a closing statement, but I feel that you guys should as well be able to, if you want, anyway, we'll see what happens. Okay. Um, <laughs> another question that I had is, um, uh, you know, I, I could really see, um, the meat advertisers, really just kind of having a field day with this, kind of a backlash, like, um, you know, well, our, this is real meat, the actual slaughtered animals. Um, you know, because right now, you know, the tendency in food, the trend in uh, food production and, and food marketing is natural, is, is know your farmer and farmer's markets and non-GMO and even Triscuit has the non-GMO, you know, co commercials. You know, so that's very much what the trend is in branding of food right now um, is natural. So I feel like th there's the possibility is there the possibility, let me rephrase that, is there the possibility that the you know, meat industry could uh, say, well, but this is real meat. We slaughtered it. It's real meat. And that could actually increase, possibly. Could it increase meat, meat consumption? Um, you know, because people want the real thing. People, I mean, it really is the case. If you read the literature, people make their dining decisions on the basis of price, taste, and convenience, like everybody does. This is going to be less expensive. It's not going to have the foodborne pathogens. It's not going to have the drug residues. Um, and it's not going to involve animal slaughter. I mean, 47% of people want to ban animal slaughter. Like, people are not eating meat because it's slaughtered. When you have a safer product that costs less, I mean, it, you know, I think it's not inconceivable, but it strikes me as horribly unlikely. Uh, in vitro meat absolutely will not prevent the CAFO system. Uh, I spend most of my time. Yep. 
Sorry. Uh, will not prevent the confined animal feeding operations, will not eat in the factory farm system. So you talked about not being in the vegan bubble. I absolutely agree. I spend most of my time in research, not reading vegan blogs, but reading the write-ups of the industry publications. You can register for all of them. I think you should. Like uh, Food Link, you know, even going to the conferences. There's one in Texas right now. And so the, the, uh, what you heard at the beginning is that the meat industry is trying to stop it from being labeled as meat. That is, well, it's uh, halfly correct. So the people who produce the meat, we like to think as vegans monolithically of the meat industry, but there's two factors. So the people raising the animals are like, hey, we want to not call in vitro meat meat. But the people who process the animals, Tyson, Cargill, Purdue, they definitely want it to be labeled meat. And they're the ones who are actively investing in the technology. Now, as you can imagine, hey, why are you investing in something that's going to hurt our bottom line is not an unasked question. My three points of how the factory farm industry is going to be helped from in vitro meat is not something I came up with, but is in essence, in different language, what they are telling their own suppliers. And they are telling their own suppliers, not that we are disrupting the industry, but that we are going to sell more meat than ever before. What they are telling them is that we have this huge demand, we can't meet all of the demand globally because we're literally running out of room, so we're going to keep the factory farms and we're going to add in vitro meat. That's not going to replace the factory farms. Remember the earlier presentation that both of them did about the growth? How is that getting rid of factory farms? Can you think of one, take your time, one industry that's gotten rid of itself? So the second thing they're saying that no one has bothered to respond to is they respond to it as a blended product. That's their term, not my term. A blended product. There's something that we call the Jensen paradox. And what that means is something you think will decrease supply or demand actually increases it. So let me give you an example of the Jensen paradox in real life. Bottled water. Look at any bottled water product and it will have some kind of label claiming that it's like 50% recycled or the one that Coke uses, that they have plants blended in with the plastic. The result of that has not been to decrease the use of plastic or bottled water. The result, because it's blended and can be marketed, has been to increase the use of bottled water. That's what's going to happen with in vitro meat when the companies that own it start blending it together. 30 seconds. And it's going to make your activism, my activism, that much harder. Okay. Okay. So we have to wrap this up now. But, but hang on. <laughs> Rest assured. What we're going to do, what, what I think I'm going to do now is we're going to give five minutes for closing statements, and you can divide that any way you want. Five minutes for closing statements. You can divide that any way you want. And, um, and then we're going to then bring a couple more chairs. We're going to invite Renee, Joanne, and Karen up here. And I'm going to run around there for an hour and answer all your questions. And you are welcome to continue asking about cell-based meat. And in fact, I know that Joanne knows a great deal about it. She is actually on the, this side. And Renee as well, supports cell-based meat. So we'll put her over here. You, you, maybe they have something they'd like to say about it as well. So we could continue this if we want, or we can go in a completely different direction, but we're going to have to wrap this part of it up. So five minutes over here. Um, I mean, I think, uh, I think probably Leah and I have said most of what we want to say. Uh, I just want to respond to um, the, the last point, and that is I, I read all of the industry publications. They talk about blended products, but when they're talking about blended products, they're talking about plant-based with meat. Um, I've certainly never seen anybody talking about cell-based blend, I don't think. Um, and it really does defy capitalism. I mean, if this, if this works and you're producing the exact same thing and you can produce it in one way that makes you more money and another way that makes you less money, why would you blend those things together? You wouldn't. You would go exclusively with the thing that makes you more money. And that's cell-based meat which is the more efficient product, so it will be the more profitable product, and it really will be like insulin. I mean, 
I guess some people still have landlines, um, but the vast majority of communication is on cell phones and text message, which are more efficient and didn't used to exist. Some people may still have film-based cameras, but the vast majority of photos are taken on our cell phones uh, because it's easier and it's more efficient um, and it's just simpler. Uh, when we shift from producing meat in CAFOs to producing meat in this other better way, the reason the meat industry is investing is that it's going to be more profitable um, and it will completely replace uh, the vast majority uh, of animal product production, just like 100% of insulin is now synthetic. Okay. Um, I, again, I think I've, like Bruce, I've said most of what I want to say. Um, I think my main thought I want you to go away with is what works. What will work? And that's what really matters. And sometimes we have to put aside you know, our comfort zone for that. And that's a big theme for me, is us moving into our discomfort zone. And I've had to do that, where I've had to sit down with a factory farmer and understand, how did he get there? Why is he doing that? Or Renee is a rancher who, you know, used to slaughter animals, and she had to move into her discomfort zone, confront her husband. Like, we have to think about it from the other perspective, because in my view, it's it's not about winning over, winning, them, winning over them. It's about winning them over. How do we win the world over? And we have to keep that at the forefront of our minds because we're up against it. We're up against 10 billion people wanting more and more and more and more and more. And that has to be at the forefront of our mind. So I ask you to think about that. What will work? What will work? Thank you. All right, five minutes on the other side. Wow, so we, uh, we have a lot to talk about still, right? Um, there, there's, I do want to say one thing, which is there's a, there's a flavor to this of snatching uh, defeat from the jaws of victory uh, to some extent, which is to say, I, and I understand that veganism is hardly taking off. However, according to the Good Food Institute itself, um, Plant-based alternatives, alternatives to animal-based foods grew 17% over the previous year. Over, overall, sorry, overall sales. I'm very sorry about that. Overall sales of vegan items in the U.S. rose 20% from 2017 to the middle of 2018. And although yes, there's a flaw in the study, uh, in uh, between 2004, 2014 and 2017, the number of U.S. consumers identifying as vegan grew 600% from 1% to 6%. Now, whatever the flaws are, I, you know, there's everything, pretty much everything that um, you folks have said about uh, shifting to, um, you know, an alternative to the system could be applied to promoting, marketing, plant-based um, things. If you want to emphasize, as, as you have, Bruce, price, taste, and convenience, you say that's the reason why consumers buy things. Well, there is a big assumption here that this new technology, first of all, is going to be exactly the same in taste or better, or, or maybe it won't be, whether it's the pricing is going to be the same. But I would caution you all, look at what happened to humane meat, right? This is, um, this is, this is basically a boutique product that yuppies buy in the cities, mostly. It's been the most explosively profitable sector of the meat industry, humane meat. It's, it's just gone through the roof. And has it improved the welfare of animals? No. Has it uh, cut down on the number of animals being killed? No. I, I just want to say that we are not, this is not a, a, a contradiction between the moral purists over here and the pragmatists over there. We are arguing, at least I think we're arguing, that it isn't going to work. It isn't going to work for the reasons we've said, that it's by strengthening meat, the idea of meat is something we must always have, it is going to keep this whole system going. And yes, millions of people will buy these new products. But the same people who, you know, own the, the uh, animal uh, commodities, living ones, will continue to do that too. And we aren't in charge of that. So basically, we're going to have to entrust the fate of the animals to this. I want to read a poem briefly by, it's very short, uh, by uh, Langston Hughes. It's called Dreams, because I think we can all agree on this. Hold fast to dreams. For if dreams die, life is a broken-winged bird that cannot fly. 
Hold fast to dreams, for when dreams go, life is a barren field, frozen with snow. When Bruce was interviewed um, by Ezra Klein, Ezra Klein, the interviewer, said, there's a tendency to make this a moral crusade, but increasingly it seems to me that if there's going to be an answer to this, it'll be technological. And I think that sums up what we're hearing here. And I, I just don't believe it. And I think even if you find this a very attractive, glittering new thing, please be very skeptical of how it's going to end up and, can, and consider the fact that it isn't going to be in our hands. It's going to be in the hands of these incredibly powerful billion-dollar corporations. And so whether we end up with, because there's been some equivocation here, zero anim, live animals being used or, as Bruce just said, a substantially reduced number of animals being used or maybe, because of Jensen's paradox, meat consumption with population growth will go up and then the, uh, the clean meat will replace a certain percentage of the um, live animals and maybe in 10 years we'll still have 50 billion land animals being killed. It's just that there'll be much more meat and people will also be eating the uh, so-called clean meat. One minute. Um, sorry. Did I take up all your time? Okay. <laughs> I'll, be, I'll be, I think, I love what you said. I'll be very quick. I want to leave you with one final simple truth. We are not going to defeat speciesism with speciesism. We are not going to convince people that animals should not be treated like machines by trying to align with their biases and try to make animals more like machines. I can't think of a single social justice movement that has ever worked by abandoning its principles. And I don't think we should start now. Thank you.